Good morning, Southside Bible Church. If you are visiting, we are grateful to have you with us. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all. It was good to see the Shelby's family come see her baptized. Special welcome to you all. Um, so my time in Arizona at the conference was very blessed. I know some of you were praying for that. I'm grateful. We looked at Psalm 23, and it just made me think we need to go through that psalm again together. So thank you for your prayers. We, we saw God move in some beautiful ways. Uh, the memorial service for Ruth, again, has been set for February 18th. And I have a pastor friend who tells his church, go to the service. When someone in our eternal family has finished the race, we pay our respects to such a faithful woman who taught us so much about service to our King. And I'm grateful for her family to do what they should do to rise up this morning and come join us and worship the God who gives and the God who takes away and the God who gave his son so that their mom and wife will live forever. And so bless you, dear brothers and sisters. Next Sunday, we'll be partaking of the Lord's table together. So I want you to be preparing your hearts for that beautiful ordinance. And we will remember our blessed hope as we gather next Sunday. This morning, we're going to continue in our study in Romans. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12, we're in our fourth year. So if you're visiting, <clears throat> I'll review real quickly. So let me read the section that we are in, verses 9 through 13, as we're looking at all these imperatives in chapter 12 as a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, and contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Let's go to our God and pray that these fruits would be made manifest in the lives of his children. Father, we come before you, and I pray that, that this is a bride that any bridegroom would love. And I, I pray, make us into these men, women, and children. By your Spirit, through this gospel, will you keep conforming us into these beautiful descriptions and imperatives and calls of the children of God. And so, Father, meet us this morning. We pray that what you um, will for us, you would empower, you would give grace to keep. And so we just begin our service at your, your feet in need of your grace to learn, to understand, to be transformed, metamorphosed into your image. And so God, meet us here. Let this be a worship service. Let us worship the God who has revealed such beautiful truth to us this morning. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, I want to start with a quote from a friend of mine uh, who penned this. I believe on Saturday, and he's talking about what we're in this section on what's called indicatives and imperatives in the Greek language. And so we've studied Romans 1 through 11, and they were all the indicatives. They, they were what God has done for us in Christ, the salvation that he has come and purchased. And now we're in this section that out of those imperatives, there's a therefore in Romans 12, 1, that we live the Christian life now in light of those things. I don't, I don't try to live these out to get justified. I live them out because I am. And so the, the imperatives and how they work together. So I'm going to read this quote. Some of you are going to be like, that's the boringest thing I've ever heard. And others are going to be like, that's it. That set me free. I finally get this. So let me give a shot at it. The indicative... Romans 1 through 11 is a statement of reality. They're, they're done. They've been accomplished. The imperative is a command. It's a command from God to his children. In the gospel, we have glorious indicatives. We, we looked at them for three years like a diamond from every facet. The indicatives are holy, what God has done in Jesus Christ. God has done it in his son. And when we believe the indicatives... We are believing that God has accomplished for us in his son, Jesus Christ, our salvation. This faith in the gospel, the glorious indicatives of God's grace. However, there are also imperatives and commands in the gospel. Those imperatives show us our sin and the kind of living that God wants from his blood-bought children. 
But the indicatives give us the foundation to these imperatives, the motivation to the imperatives, and the empowerment to live the imperatives. You can never do this in your own power and strength. It will never happen. Some want to only emphasize the indicatives. That's all we want to preach on while we neglect the imperatives. This is called cheap grace or easy believism. Some preach only the imperatives divorced from the indicatives. This is legalism. It's Pharisaism. It's bondage. It's impossible. No one can keep them. The New Testament pattern is to declare God's glorious indicatives in the gospel first. What God has done precedes what we do, but we dare not fail to preach the imperatives. The imperatives from the ethical outcome of the gospel, this whole book is the obedience of the faith is what Paul's writing about. The gospel bears fruit, it transforms and changes lives. The imperatives show us the way to live, but the imperatives are always connected to the indicatives as the ground or reason for the imperatives. The indicatives also provide the motivation for the imperative, grace motivated. The indicatives also provide empowerment, grace, spirit of God empowering us to live them, to obey them. The indicative and imperative work in tandem, and he says they're wonderful friends, but they need to be kept together and kept in the right order. And that's what I've been trying to say for three years, four years. So I, I hope that was clear as a whistle. Raise your hand if that made any sense. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Now back to what I have to say, so keep your hands down. <clears throat> so let's take a look at Paul's next command of these gospel imperatives for the children of God. The way to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice, to renew our minds in truth in God's word, so that by knowing the will of God, we might be, again, metamorphosed, transformed into his image by the Holy Spirit, who's the agent that will transform us. The word understood, the spirit working within by pointing to Jesus and what he is for us. He's a floodlight on Jesus, and that's where transformation will come from. So we have learned in Romans 12 that God gives to every believer a grace gift that will be used to impart grace into our brothers and sisters to be conformed in the image of Christ. We are unified, we're one in this hope of Jesus Christ, and we use these gifts in helping each other be built up. Verse 9, Paul says, let our love be without hypocrisy. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is now a, a love that can love genuinely because he first loved us. And then we are called to the purity of love. We love what God loves. We cleave to what is good. And he says, we abhor what is evil. These are passionate things that a new heart produces. From the heart, I hate what is evil. And I cleave to what is good, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all those good things flow from him. And then last week, the family and love and the body of Christ is to, to be our pursuit and our passion. Uh, let be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. And so now this morning, we will take up, Paul will, will begin to show us what should be the fuel that burns within the believer to keep driving us to serve King Jesus. And as we serve our King forever, Paul is calling us to have a strong focus and a deep intensity as we do this. Uh, the, the, for, I think a couple of you are visiting from Lutheran. There, there was one time I was watching a basketball game and this kid made the most beautiful move you've ever seen and then missed the two-foot jump shot. And, and the coach said, don't have a million-dollar move with a 10-cent finish. And so we've just looked at the million-dollar glorious gospel. Don't give it a 10-cent finish. And what, the, what it calls from believers is live your lives worthy of the calling that you have received. And so let's look at what that finish should be. Not lagging behind in diligence. What a powerful wake-up call this is to the sleepy church in America. Some of you need to wake up for me to exhort you to wake up this morning. It boiled off the adokimos in our mind to approve what is the will of God for my life. It's the fervor and the focus that God wants from his adopted children. One com commentator said the Christian life is like a volcano. 
there's a great eruption at the start and then dormancy for the remainder. That's what Paul is saying it should not be. John said in Ephesus, you have forsaken, you've forgotten your first love. And so I remember those first days for me when the gospel broke in. It was not an inferno in my heart. And this week as I sat back and asked my heart, is there anything that you've seen in Christ over all these years of studying, communing, and looking at him that could douse that fire? Uh, I, I sat and thought, I might not have the same energy since battling COVID, but I'm, I'm seeing him maybe clearer than I've ever seen him and just saying, Lord, light the fire. I think of that missionary who looked at a land and said, let me burn out for Christ in my service uh, to this body. So in our text, Paul says in verse 12, 1, the therefore and the mercies of God that have been given to us in Christ Jesus, he says this, we don't flame out. Because there's a therefore in our lives, our flame does not go out. It may flicker, but the pilot will not go out in the redeemed heart. We need it to be stoked in the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ and to look at it from every angle. We need it to be stoked by time with him in the secret place. We need it to be stoked by good fellowship. We need it to be stoked at the communion table, at, at the at baptisms. Th those three baptisms were just beautiful. And I'm sitting here going, they just nailed the gospel, all three of them, perfect. That, that is a means of grace to stoke the fire. And so Paul exhorts us in this way, in, in diligence, don't be pokey. In the spirit, be boiling. In the Lord, serving Jesus Christ. And I would say that the diligence and the fervency of spirit is to describe how we're to serve the king. So those two are leading up to this third point. So we are not to lag behind in our diligence. This word lagging behind means hesitating, shrinking, lazy. This is simply a call to not be lazy in our service to Christ, to not be rocked to sleep by this world to not be sluggish, to not, as Paul said, do not waste your opportunity. Redeem the time that God has given to you. And so my dear brothers and sisters, our calling in Christ is to active duty. We, we have not got on the love boat to take a cruise ship to heaven, but we've entered a battleship to serve our captain and advance his cause with great diligence while we have life. This sweet gospel that we've studied in Romans 8, an eternal security that no one can snatch us out of the hand of God, that is not to rock us to sleep into spiritual sloth, but to secure us for faithful service to the head, Jesus Christ. And so I'll ask you this morning, has the delay of the bridegroom in coming back made you drowsy? How, how is your temperature as you sit here this morning in your heart? Not lagging behind in our diligence. That word means eagerness, earnestness, effort. Don't be lazy in diligence is what he's saying. Isn't that a powerful statement? Don't be lazy in diligence. In zeal, don't be slothful. Moral earnestness. We're to be alive. We're alive in Christ Jesus. We're alive from the dead. We are to be vigorous. Don't be slothful in your diligence. Don't be lazy in your efforts. This is a call to active duty. This is a Christian marked by earnestness. I'm thinking of the parable of the 10 virgins in Matthew 25. And it says that while the bridegroom was delaying, that's the season we live in, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. So while they're waiting for the bridegroom to come back, they got drowsy and fell asleep. So when he came, the, their lamps weren't, weren't trimmed and they weren't ready for him. Ten virgins, the talents, the sheep and the goats, that whole chapter is to be ready for the king of kings when he comes back in diligence, being found ready. In the end days, Christ said, most people's love will grow cold. And if love grows cold for your Savior, service will freeze. And so, Lord, how do I thaw out? How do I thaw out? Well, there's only one way, as we've seen in Romans, is to look to Calvary's tree. And I, I mean to look and stare and believe that he died for sloths and to see him hanging in your place and in the place that you deserve. Stare, stare your eyes out at the cross. 
Look to the one who never ceased to give his life away in the gospels, it's manifested. Look to the one who wrapped you in his righteousness. Is that not smelling salt to your soul? (laughs) Get in the word and bathe in the gospel. Read John until you burn again for the one who was burned in God's wrath for you. I want you to see how this word is used in the Bible. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, he says that we're to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. We're, We're to be so diligent to keep that beautiful unity that Christ has purchased for us. 2 Peter 1.5, he said, For this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and your moral excellence, knowledge, and your knowledge, self-control. And he goes through this whole list and says, If these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful, slothful. And the true knowledge, the epinosis, the full knowledge of Jesus Christ, not just academic in the heart, And he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten the indicative, his purification from his former sins. You forgot the gospel. You've drifted from it. That's why you're falling asleep. That's why you're getting slothful. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as you practice these things, you will not stumble. Hebrews 6, the writer says, Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, not falling away and being apathetic, things that accompany salvation. Though we're speaking in this way, for God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name and having ministered and still ministering to all the saints. That's been Romans 12. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God, serving the body of Christ. That is, that is, don't become sluggish. And Paul writes at the end of the great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And so we don't come to Christ and slide into heaven. And I've had many say, wait a minute, Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Amen, hallelujah. And and we are to work then in the diligence that he's calling us to out of rest. And the only way to do that is through a therefore, that you're not working to get accepted, you're working because you are. And so we need to make sure that we're working out of rest. I'm not working and laboring to get God's acceptance. I'm laboring and I can't burn out because I have his acceptance. There's a big difference. One, you will burn out. The other, you can't burn out. It can't go out. I'm under grace. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain But I labored to the point of fatigue even more than all of the apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. And this fuel, the grace of God, I can labor to the point of fatigue and I will not wear out. We're to live in an active, earnest life for Jesus. One man, I love this. He said, there's no Rip Van Winkles in heaven. If you want to know who Rip Van Winkle is, it's an old parable. Go look it up afterwards. You can Google it. Uh, the parable of the talents. What what do we do with the grace gift that God has put within us, within each one of us? What do we do with the love that he's put in our heart for the brethren? It's not a trivial thing to be lazy with these gifts. Thomas Watson wrote a book from a statement by Jesus called Heaven Taken by Storm. And today's version would be Heaven Taken by Sleep and Sloth. Apathy. I heard about the teacher one time he walked in the classroom and he just wrote apathy across the board and slammed down the chalk and walked out. And the, the one guy next to the, one of the students said, what does that mean? And the guy goes, who cares? <laughs> so I want you to hear this clearly. If sick, health, COVID, age, you can't serve them like when you were young. But, but you can do what you, you do have. One, God says, I'll give one talent and five talents. And there'll be different things that he requires of us. And you can pray. 
And you can love, come and love when you, uh, your health allows it. But I want you to see it's not how much. It's a, it's a heart that's fervent. And it prays and it cares and it does what it can. I'm watching so many older saints who are diligent, limping along. We have a deacon here who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And he serves this body day and night. Uh, because you can't take the fire out of his heart. I got one, one lady who counsels the younger women, and every time I call her with someone, can you meet with them? The answer every time, yes. She can't, she can't wear out. Revelation 2.19, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Your deeds as of late are greater than the ones than at first. Paul said, don't grow weary in well-doing. Jonathan Edwards wrote resolutions number six. He said, I resolve to live with all my might while I live. I resolve to live with all my might while I do live. And so I beg you, by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, to not just pass through this world, living for this world, putting down tent stakes. I beg you to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. John Wesley, we all know his story of conversion and he was running around serving the Lord as an unbeliever and one night he's listening to Luther's preface being read and and he said as he was reading that it said even my sins could be forgiven and it finally hit him even my sins and he found this full forgiveness and it set in his heart a fire that could not be put out it said that he traveled 250,000 miles by horse and feet while he preached the gospel anywhere and everywhere He said, I propose to be busy as long as I live, as long as my health is indulged to me, I will give myself to the service of Christ. Let us be diligent to labor for the advancement of the kingdom of God. William Carey looked at India and said, Lord, let me burn out for you in service to these heathen. I don't want to die with any bullets left. So secondly then, he says, you need to be fervent in spirit. The word fervent, beautiful word, it means hot or boiling over or to be a glow. Boiling in your spirit or those in a good fire where they're glowing with red, the the power of heat. There's a fire within that is generated by the Spirit of God pointing you to Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. It doesn't produce lukewarmness. This was used of Apollos in Acts 18.24. There was a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man who came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. And so he was mighty and fervent in the spirit. Second Timothy 1.6, Timothy's becoming timid. Paul says, this reason I remind you, Timothy, kindle afresh the gift of God, which is through you on the laying of our hands. We, we laid hands on you and anointed you to go minister the gospel. God has not given you a spirit of timidity, Timothy, but of power and love and discipline. Don't, don't, don't let the power and the pressures of the world and the inside the church take away your fire, Timothy. Look at Jesus Christ and, and boil. His spirit has been given to you for that. John the Baptist was a burning and shining light. Calvin had a a hand holding a burning heart over his desk. Paul was relentless for Christ. The church was not moved by unmoved men and women. Be fervent in spirit. And if you look in verse 11, serving the Lord. I think this is the key to the whole verse. How do I not burn out? How do I not wear out? How does the fire not go out in me? I've done this for so long. You're making me wait. I just, you know, some of you young guys, I I just want to start and you're holding me back. How do I not lose the fire? Who we are serving is the answer for every one of us this morning. Just look at that. Serving who? The Lord. The highest privilege on earth is to serve Jesus Christ. I think of Jacob who had to serve 14 years in order to marry Rachel. And he said it just seemed as a, as a day because of his great love for her. It feels like a day for me serving Christ. 
The hymn writer said, never let me outlive my love for him. I think of how I served sin when I was an unbeliever and young. What I could do on a weekend was unbelievable. I, I never lagged behind in diligence. I was fervent in spirit. I, I, I never ran out of energy to be able to party and be foolish. You know, I didn't even need sleep. It, just, the, the, it was an inextinguishable energy to sin and be a fool. And for what? For who? The God of this world? Now you come and you add the Lord. And I've got an inextinguishable fire. It just can't go out. I've pastored for 32 years, hard 32 years. And every time I start thinking, I need to retire, I got to slow down. I have a quiet time and I see his face and it just, the fire is stoked again, right? Every time you look at him, it's like, I, I can't sit. Everything else in my life, I ask Laura, do I have perseverance in anything else? You know, I, 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 I can't, she has to fix everything in our house because I try and I'm like, I can't figure this out. I can't even change a filter on my furnace. Like, which screwdriver do you use? And the minute I can't get it, I just quit. Just per, no perseverance in anything. I didn't even know what a, what a C was in high school. And it wasn't because I had A's and B's. <laughs> I just stopped at everything except serving Jesus my Lord doesn't make any sense unless you've seen Jesus my Lord with the rest of our time I want to encourage you then how do you stoke the fire how do, I want to make sure this isn't a self effort call I want to Take your little flicker this morning and not pour water on it. I want to take that and just turn it up. Came across some stuff a few weeks ago studying from a preacher, and it just hit me, and I said, I'm just going to borrow that. And so it's not original, and all I'm here for is your blessing, not for any of my glory. So I want you to, he said, compare three other things that the Bible says you can serve. And one, he says that um, you can serve your belly instead of Jesus. Romans 16, 17 through 18, we'll get there in a couple years. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. And so this is a call not to serve your own appetites and desires. To not treat them as the most compelling desires of your life. But Jesus is to be the most compelling pleasure for those who live by faith. He is to be the supreme pleasure. Serving Christ is better than food, sex, and possessions. He's better than any of those other appetites. Secondly, serve Jesus and not people. But I thought we learned last week we're supposed to serve people. I thought we were giving gifts to serve people. We, we deny ourselves and sacrifice and use our gifts and love to benefit people. But I'm thinking of Ephesians 6.6. 6. He says, serve not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as do losses of Jesus Christ, as slaves doing the will of God from the heart. The whole gospel in a verse and so he's saying, don't serve people in this way where you're just trying to get their approval. So we, when we serve each other, it's not for their approval, it's for their blessing and good. And so we quit serving to get people to like us, accept us, and love us. Throw it out. I just consult with Jesus, not what others think of me or accept me or reject me. The, the goal of the Christian life is I want one approval, and I have it. I have an audience of one, that's freedom. To finally be done with trying to gain everything in this world's approval. I have the whole Trinity's approval this morning because of the work of Jesus Christ. I can quit serving the slavish fear of others and just go love them now and serve the way we're supposed to. So don't serve people for their acceptance and favor. And now the whole sermon. Don't serve the law serve Jesus. That has been the whole book of Romans. If you'll turn back to Romans chapter 7, 
I just felt like we have to go back there. I've quoted it, I've said it, I've preached on it, but we're going to look at it one last time. <clears throat> it's just so good. Romans 7, 1 through 3, a simple analogy. He says, Do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. As long as you're living, you're under the law. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. She's no longer married and she's free. In verse 3, so then, if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she'll be called an adulteress. She's breaking the law. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law so that she's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. So it's a simple illustration. Her husband, if he dies, she's free from the law of that marriage and she's free to marry another now and to have the, the fruit of a beautiful marriage. And now Paul's going to take that and drive home the most beautiful thing for us as children of God. Therefore, everything good starts with therefore. Amen? Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law. That's the law of Moses. You've died to it because Jesus came and fulfilled every jot and tittle. You have died. You're not under it any longer. So you died to it. How did I die to it? Through the body of Christ. Christ is the one who has set you free from the law. So that, here's the purpose. You could be joined to another. So now that you're not under the law, you can be married to someone else. And that name is Jesus Christ. The gospel, when you believe you are joined in holy matrimony, one, you're made one with Jesus Christ. And that marriage is going to do something mighty. It says that in order that, the one who was raised from the dead, in order that he might bear fruit for God. And so in this new marriage, something's going to boil up called the fruit of the Spirit. And instead of you going around trying to grind it out under the law and try to work it to get God's favor, I have his favor. I'm married to the bridegroom in a love relationship. And as I abide in him, fruit is going to begin now to come out of your life. Serving Christ, hear this, is not serving a new law. We replace the Mosaic covenant. We die to it and we come down to say, okay, now I got a new law. So now I have the Sermon on the Mount. That's my new law. I follow that. I got the fruit of the Spirit. I work on it every day. I try to get more joy. I fight to get more peace. And at the end of the fruit of the Spirit, he says, against such thing, there is no law. You can't produce fruit by law. And everyone just moves over and uses that as your new standard to fight, try to bear false plastic fruit. So get this. The focus now in the new covenant is not the law. The focus in the new covenant is a person. And it is the second person of the Trinity who loved me and gave himself for me. That's our focus. And that's our, I'm done with Mosaic law. I get to stare at Jesus now. And why does that make such a massive difference in people's lives? So much so that a new love bubbles up now, a genuine love that abhors evil and clings to what is good and loves the brethren. How does that happen? Because Jesus is not a law demander. He's a law fulfiller. And so he's not just a, a list that you go keep. He fulfilled the law. And he's so different than Moses. Moses, do this and live, disobey and die. And Jesus holds out hands with holes in them and says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus says, I will do this and I will die in your place. And I just want you to see the two are so radically different. One's an old covenant and one's a new covenant and you can't put new wine and old wineskins because it'll burst. You can't keep those things together. And so I've spent most of my ministry fighting you to not go back to Moses. We love to do it. But to reach forward to what lies ahead, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was a law demander. And Romans said that no one could keep it and ever be justified before God. So the law, no one would ever be able to keep and fulfill. It was given to be a mirror to show you that you couldn't keep it and who you really are. Not to try to clean yourself up on it. 
that killed us, that slew us. And now, under the new covenant with faith, our focus is on one person, the law fulfiller and the curse bearer. And that changes everything. Moses didn't love me, but Jesus did with a height, depth, and a breadth, and a length that no one can understand. Changes people. I've watched it again and again and again. So if you sit here burdened down trying to fulfill the law and now trying to fulfill Romans 12, I have the best news for you this morning. Christianity is not a new law. It's replacing the law with a person. And we're married to him so that we might produce fruit for God like using our gifts to genuinely love one another, to give each other honor and wash each other's feet, to have a fervor and a diligence for this king. That's what happens when you're married to Jesus Christ. And so the first thing you encounter in the Gospels is you meet Jesus. And Jesus was born of, of a virgin by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 3.15, Jesus answered them and said, Permitted at this time his baptism, for in this way it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. <clears throat> Jesus came and fulfilled every jot and tittle of righteousness. He fulfilled it all. And when he's being baptized, the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And now that's what the Father says about you because of Jesus' law-keeping. This is my beloved son or daughter who I am well pleased because of what Jesus has done. He, doesn't, he does what we cannot do. He trusted the Father in everything. He obeyed everything. He loved with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what is more, in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so he went up and was cursed for all of our transgressions of the law. He bore the justice and the punishment that our sins deserved. He died a curse for all of my transgressions and breathed his last for me. Those are two massive things. He fulfilled the law's demands and he bore the curse for all of my failures. And when I look at that, the Holy Spirit reveals that to my heart. And you know what happens? A fire has started. You can't look at that and say, what's for lunch? There's a, there's a fire. There's a fire. And it burns by the fuel of the, or the coal of the person and work of Jesus Christ. I'm glad I don't have to look at Moses. I get to look at Jesus. And as I do, it is fuel for this fire. Praise be to God for the law fulfiller and not the law demander. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so I want you to hear this last encouragement then. All of our serving others then is receiving service from Christ. It's his power, it's his service to serve others. So when I see this Christ serving everyone and, and you couldn't tire him out, you couldn't wear him out, and, and that is the power that's flowing to me through the Spirit of God in my union with Jesus. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That is flowing to me. Every service that I do is enabled by Jesus Christ. That's why you never pat yourself on the shoulder. It's just all things through him. That's the Christian life. Just a few texts, Romans 15, 18. I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, says Paul, resulting in the obedience of Gentiles by word and deed. Colossians 1, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, I labor to the point of fatigue, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. The, the power of Christ flowing through Paul. He just knew it was grace. It was him. By the grace of God, he said, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
And so I just want you to see now that in this relationship, being joined to him, looking to Jesus, there's a, there's a power to go serve the king forever in fervor, not lacking in diligence, laboring for that beautiful name. I love that quote by uh, John Bunyan. It says, run, John, run, the law demands, but neither gives feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings to go love God and love others without hypocrisy. Because I'm done with the law demander. I've been made alive to the law fulfiller. And in him there are 10,000 charms. And so may we learn to abide in him. Apart from him we can do nothing. And in him we can love with fervor and zeal to serve the King of Kings. And nothing can squelch it. Nothing can take it out. And so I want you to see it can go up and down, but there is this what you've seen in Jesus that will always revive you when you come back and look at the beauty of this gospel. It just, it's just, it's, in, it's inextinguishable. I mean, the guy who quits everything, and I just can't quit because of what I've seen in Jesus Christ and see daily in this beautiful word. And so Lord, stoke the fire this morning by your word and by your spirit. Those who are drowsy from this American dream and all the things that you're drinking up and pursuing, may, may he wake you up as you gaze again at what Christ the law fulfiller has done for us and the one who took our curse on that tree. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. How can I look at him and want to give a 10 cent finish? How can I want to live unworthy of such beauty of what he's done for me? God, I pray for every heart here this morning, Lord, that you would be the lifter of their head. Lord, that you would give them life. That you would let them look and stare again into the face of Christ. And that the fire would be stoked. Stoke it with the coals of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Stoke it with a righteousness that makes us acceptable to you even this morning. God, stoke our hearts with such a beautiful gospel that comes by faith and not by works. Lord, let it be treasured in every heart. Revive us, O oh Lord. Revive us unto inexhaustible service for the name that is above every name. So God, use us for your name's sake, empowered by the gospel of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.